Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Chun Zheng, and I always, always use the WebNIC agent of the age over the web. And today I'm talking about NGX rule, one of my many, many, many open source NGX C modules. And uh, so my NGX adventure started almost five years ago when I was still in Taobao working on a data analytics web application for the Taobao marketplace. And we pro uh, most of the words are Chinese, so, so you can get a basic idea. It's almost like Google Analytics, but for Taobao's merchants. Oh, my god. Anyway, so it was uh, the original architecture of, the, of that old data analytics web application. We have just uh, two or three NGX servers in the middle to serve all the incoming traffic. There's a lot of traffic. And we have to access a huge MySQL cluster. And the Taobao's real-time statistics cluster, which uses its own binary uh, wire protocol, and also a Tokyo Tyrant cluster, a key value storage for other things. So in this architecture, we used to run PHP in the middle the, after NX, and the performance was horrible because it, it, uh, it's extensive use of blocking I.O. on the back end. So NGX only solves half the problem. It solves the uh, blocking I.O. on the front end, but not the back end. So when one of the MySQL node in the MySQL cluster is very slow to respond, well, uh, will affect all the, all the user traffic, even though the targeting node is not the guilty node. So I came there to solve this problem. I want, want to solve this with a lot of NXC modules, so that we don't use PHP, we don't use, use anything. We just use nx.conf to build a web application. And, oh. My God, you cannot see the other half. <laughs> Sorry for the resolution. So I created a lot of, I hate this stage. I, I created a lot of NXC modules, like, uh, or participated in some of them. And I created NX3 module to talk to my SQL directly from within NX core using a non-blocking MySQL C library named libdrizzle. The official lib MySQL client library is all, almost always blocking. So, and other things like encrypted session, XSSS, and, and talking to memcached completely with using the full memcached protocol instead of using the standard memcached module that only understands gets. And also I created NX echo for simple APIs and NX SR cache to cache everything with anything, like caching any responses with memcached, with Redis, with anything that you can imagine with the help of NX sub requests, and also set misc that you can use conditional get, uh, conditional sets. Uh, it's more powerful than you, in my humble opinion. And also NX Redis. NX Revar headers more for manipulating headers. It's more powerful than the standard headers module in NX Core because it allows you to actually override the headers, both the request headers and the response headers. Okay, so but when the business logic becomes more and more complicated. It become, um, our NGX conf configuration file becomes more and more convoluted, and it's harder and harder to maintain. And especially, we are tired of writing more and more NGX C modules because C programming is hard, and we want to avoid it whenever possible. So here came my former colleague at Taobao. He's, he's a mysterious man named Carol Swaffle. So he said, he talked to me, and said, hey, let's embed a dynamic language into the NGX core to save this NGX conf mess. Why Lua? He convinced me that Lua is a very small language, easy to learn in a 
lazy afternoon, and the VM is so small that you can even even hard to it's even hard to notice its existence. So we have this marriage, nx plus rule. Essentially, we have this model. We embed the Lua JIT VM. It's a just-in-time compiler for Lua, many, many times faster than Lua in many cases. And NX uses the pre-fork model so that the Lua JIT VM can fork into many instances uh, in the form of various workers, which are doing the heavy lifting. The VM is shared on the worker level so that all the incoming traffic may have a chance to either exchange Lua values directly. It also opens the opportunity to share a lot of complicated data structures. So we learn a lesson from Node.js, no callback hell. And, but we still want to enjoy 100% non-blocking I.O. That's the whole point of this project. And we created a lot of hooks, it's NGX configuration directives over the years to allow the user to, in, to, uh, to inject Lua code into various different processing phases in the NGX core, like the rewrite phase, the content phase, the access phase, the header filter phase, which is not a formal phase, but you get the idea. And also the body filter thing and the init worker the Lua code is invoked upon worker initialization. That is the forking part. And also the init by Lua, which runs the Lua code in the configuration loading phase uh, right in the master process, NGX master process. So we have a lot of phases. So we, ha we also have a lot of opportunities to do interesting things while NGX is busy doing something. And I created the CoSocket thing with KLSlawful. Um, what is CoSocket? We, we, we thought very hard to come up with this name, and I'm very pleased with this name. So CoSocket is coroutine-based socket. Lua has native coroutine support, uh, which means that we can still write code synchronously. But the magic happens automatically under the hood. Everything's non-blocking and asynchronous on the C level. And uh, based on which, I created s several, three at the beginning, uh, drivers, like my SQL driver, the memcached driver, and the Redis driver, all in pure Lua and have very great performance because the high level abstraction in CoSocket design. And the CoSocket implementation is essentially the same as in the standard NGX HTTP upstream mechanism in the NGX core, based on which various standard modules like proxy, fast CGI, UWSGI, and et cetera, are built. So, but, but, but my design is more flexible because I want to solve much harder problems, and not just a, a one-way, simple, one-way round trip. I used to fight with the NGX HTTP upstream mechanism in NGX core a lot to let it uh, do a lot of funny things like pipelining, like many round trips, and et cetera, but running into a lot of troubles. You, you can imagine how hard it, it was when I created the NGX Trezo module, which talks to MySQL. It requires MySQL's own handshake, MySQL's own communication protocol, and it's, it was pretty hard. So I learned a lesson, I learned it very well. I created a code socket, a more flexible interface based on which we can create way more interesting drivers and applications. So, so still everything's based on the basic NGX event model. So we are still using the same, exactly the same NGX event loop for all the IO events. We also implement, actually duplicate, the connection pool implementation in our code sockets. And it's not, it's not the same thing, but it's very similar.
and then the community blooms. Uh, both, uh, both the community and I have created a lot of, a lot of Lua Resty blah, blah, blah libraries over the years. And some of them are standard libraries like WebSocket, like MySQL, like upload for multi-part uploading, yes. 100% streaming processing. And uh, Redis, as mentioned before, and lock, a non-blocking mutex, and HTTP simple from Brian and Kings, and uh, DNS. This library was, was originally created by myself for Cloudflare, because Cloudflare requires talking to internal DNS servers and external DNS servers in fancy ways, and I need very, very uh, detailed control of all the requests and the response handling. So it deserves a separate library. And also Beanstalk D for talk, talking to the, not Amazon Beanstalk D, it's a C implementation of a message queue from the Ruby community and also for handle a socket in the MySQL world and other things, and SMTP for sending emails or 100% non-blocking I.O. because uh, their basis is on code sockets. And the code is also very clean and straightforward. It, it, it's, worth mention, it's worth mentioning that code sockets API is trying to be compatible with the Lua socket library which has been there for years in the Lua community. So if you have a legacy Lua drivers based on Lua socket, it should be straightforward and relatively easy to port it over or to, uh, over to code sockets. Uh, so I think I have to give this a mess, if you want to call it, a, a name. OpenRSD. So OpenRSD is a web application framework or server or platform by bundling NX Core, NX Lua module, all the other NXC modules you've seen before, and these Lua RSD Lua libraries. So it's a, I want it to be a necro system, a kingdom. <laughs> and uh, also I created a relatively large testing cluster on Amazon EC2. Uh, after I left Taobao, I, I spent, a, I took a year off in a beautiful southern city in China and working on OpenRSD exclusively. So over that year, I created a cluster on Amazon EC2 to test everything because we have accumulated a lot of things and testing is an art. I spent most of my time on testing. And you can see, always check out the latest test reports on the website qa.openresd.org. So uh, on that page, you can see all the different testing modes and all the components being tested, as well as all the fancy testing tools I've been using. And the, most of the tools are also very general that can be used for other projects even not related to NX. And then I joined Cloudflare after one year of wandering. Uh, fortunately, Cloudflare uses a relatively similar architecture, though it's a very different thing. In Taobao, I created a web application, full-fledged full web application with user logging, with various data reports in HTML, Ajax, and MySQL, caching, a lot of things. And, and in Cloudflare, it's essentially a reverse proxy based on Ajax, of course. And uh, we serve all the traffic uh, for our customers, which run the Oregon service themselves. And we provide speed up and security for our customers. And so in this proxy, we need the capability of scripting. Not just the nx.conf scripting, but real scripting, like in Lua. And so Cloudflare invited me to join. 
and, and help them to build the, this thing. And so the NGX proxy needs to talk to DNS servers so as to know where the origin servers are and it requires dynamic resolving because the customer may change it, the target at any time. So it has to be on the fly and also caching is important too. So it's not a real time changes, but soft to real time or something. And also it requires to access a key value store. It's a distributed key value service based on Q2 Tycoon. We used to say Q2 Tyrant. It, they, they, they are from the same guy. He seemed to be a Japanese hacker. And uh, Q2 Tycoon is used to distribute our metadata, our customers' configurations, like origin service configuration, et cetera. The metadata is distributed to, the, to our global network over Q2 Tycoon via its master-slave replication. As, and there are other things, little things, not mentioned, not joined in this graph, but you can get the idea. So we need to be 100% non-blocking here because we serve a huge amount of traffic at Cloudflare. It's a CDN company, it's a security company. And since then, I helped the uh, my, my colleagues to build the Lua CDN thing, which is, which is a dynamic dispatcher for very different sites because we run a lot of sites behind us. And these sites may have different requirements, different configurations, and a lot of little things. So we need a dispatcher for our proxy logic. So Lua CDN is for that. And Lua Web is a, it's a Model security port. Let, let's put it this way. And uh, we and John Grant Cummy, my current colleague, uh, develops a Perl script that can translate uh, Apa Apache's model security's rule set configurations directly over to Lua code and run it uh, blazingly fast. So. And, and also, we, we need a dynamic configuration in WAF. That's why we, ch we, we chose Lua here. And the site owner may fine tune the model security rules on the fly and such that we can respond to issues like false positives very quickly. And another thing about a compiler is that we do have a chance to optimize the rule set to death and generate very compact Lua code that even human, uh, even human uh, uh, is hard to, to understand. So it gives us a lot of opportunities. And Lua SSL is for dynamic SSL handshake because we run a lot of HTTPS sites, especially after the universal SSL product was announced. So the problem is that we do have too many certificates and too many private keys and too many side configurations. And we cannot cache them or preload them in every single node in, of Cloudflare. So we have to load the certificates lazily, on desire, on requirement. So we, I'll talk about it in detail later, so we, we have a Lua SSL product that can do all the magic on the fly without sacrificing performance. And actually, this talk is about new things, about good changes. And one of the new feature added to NX Lua module is the light threads. I want it for long. So essentially, light thread is not like operating system thread, but it's similar from the user's perspective, but on the implementation, it's actually, the little man is like the operating system thread. The cards are light threads. So the operating system thread push the card, i.e. a light thread forward, forward, forward until this card has a IO operation that cannot be completed immediately. So the little guy, the OS thread, leaves this card and resume another card that can can proceed. So this is how it works. Why it's so efficient? Because there's no high overhead involves, involved in the OS contact switches and also memory. 
footprint usage is very efficient because we do not maintain big COS thread stack. And also we can eliminate unnecessary switches because the switches will only happen upon IOE again. So we can use this API to create a light thread, NX thread dot spawn, and then this thread A will run automatically in the background. It's unlike the standard Lua code routine, right? Because the standard Lua code routine, you have to resume it yourself and use it yourself. So with light thread, everything works out of the box. You don't worry about it. It's just like post six threads, but it's efficient. Like similar to Alon's lightweight process and goes Golan, if you want to put it that way. And also you have thread weight so that you can do thread synchronization with this weight method. On, just like the post six processes, only parent can wait on its children. <laughs> you can wait on multiple threads if you want. And you can also have this queue method to queue a pending thread that takes for too long. And with threads, you can, in a single re NX request, create multiple concurrent uh, upstream requests to various different backends, like you can access PostgreSQL, MySQL, Memcached at once. Actually, it's concurrently. For I.O., it's at the same time to save the latency. Otherwise, the total latency of the whole request will be A plus B plus C. And, right, uh, and with light threads, it's just the worst latency of all these N queries. And also, I created Lua Rusty WebSocket. A German co company warn wanted to use WebSocket from OpenResty, from NX Lua. So, so you're suggesting that instead of writing Lua for routines, you would end up writing a light thread. And uh, the smart user is going to do the schedule for the light threads. Oh, yes. So what yeah. Is the context of the light threads? Right? You mean the scheduler? Yeah, yeah. Because oh. Lua is going to schedule at a certain. Oh, yeah. It's for routines, right? So, are you thinking of the. I I implemented a live thread and also coroutine scheduler in NGX Lua Core that is tightly integrated with the NGX event model. And it understands sub-requests, understands NGX timers, understands everything in the NGX world. So the scheduler was implemented with special care in the NGX Lua Core. So, so. Uh, it's NGX, now it's the NGX event loop's responsibility to schedule everything, like which thread to resume or which request should be resumed. So it's I.O. scheduler. And it's not preemptive threads, it's collaborative. So it simplifies a lot of things. And a German data analytics company wanted to use WebSocket to, to gather the traffic information of all its customers' web pages. And they wanted to use WebSocket because it's more reliable than just a, a synchronous AJAX request. And some people are also wanted to use it for web IM chats. And there's a Lua RESTI WebSocket library, which is a standard Open RESTI component that you can use to set up a WebSocket, non-blocking WebSocket server very quickly, a top AJAX out of the box. It's more, more flexible than NX on WebSocket proxying because that was just a proxying and it doesn't even try to understand a WebSocket frame protocol. But this library implements a f almost a full RFC protocol. And you can do many fancy things like receive frames or send frames and et cetera. Also, there was a strong desire in the community that people want to use full duplex co-sockets. What, what does full duplex mean? It actually means that there's a read thread reading from a co-socket, and there's another writer thread writing to the co-socket at the same time. 
TCP protocol allow set because the reading and the writing parts are essentially separated and cannot conflict interfere with each other. It's very useful when you implement a IM chat in this context because you have two threads. One thread is handling one direction of traffic. The other thread is handling another direction of traffic. Let's, more, let's be more specific. Let's say thread A reads from the downstream via WebSocket and then push, publish the message to Redis via its PubSub API, its rise, its read and writes this direction. And another thread, you have the other direction. It reads the published Redis web uh, messages down and writes to the WebSocket. So two directions can happen at the same time without interfering with each other, and it's very efficient. And again, we eliminate the needs for callbacks. And there's another strong requirement from the community that I, they want SSL and the TLS code sockets for accessing backend HTTPS or other services like MySQL's SSL connection services. So I implemented. Now this works. www.cloudflare.com is a HTTPS site, and then we connect it on the port 443, and then we do a SSL handshake, similar to ModSec, but not quite. And we can specify whether we want to enable or disable SSL sessions, either ID sessions or ticket sessions, depending on the online protocol of an SSL handle set. And also, what an SNI name to give, this is a TLS extension, which allows a web, website to run multiple IPs. Uh, sorry, to run multiple sites using the same IP. Just distinguishing various, size, various different sites via SNI name. And also whether we need to verify everything. Default is not, so that you can save the checking overhead. And there's a not yet open sourced NGX Lua configuration directive named SSL cert certificate by Lua. It's very similar to the standard SSL certificate directive with one minor difference. That is, you can have Lua in it. And which means that when open the SSL st starts a handshake, but not fully started, it will check various things like certificate and, and keys and the other things. And in this very phase, you have the ability to run your own Lua code to load the certificate on the fly from an external data source, like from a MySQL database or from a memcached service. That's a huge capability. And everything happens non-blockingly. Thanks to the new OpenSSL, it's one zero two better. <laughs> the latest ever release. So it's a better release, and we are using it in production. <laughs> with our own changes. It's our own open SSL fork. And adding other things like keyless SSL, which means that we don't have to maintain our customer's private key. The keys can still on the origin service. And we are also a proxy for the handshake thing. And that's a long story, and I'll save this for another talk. So. And another interesting thing that we can do here is to do SSL handshake uh, denial of service protection. Because for NGX standard limited request and limited connection modules, they, they are running the pre, in the pre-access phase way after the full for, for SSL handshake is completed. So it's already too late. And uh, in this phase, it's early. The, the handshake is not fully started yet, so we can do a lot of protection in this phase. Oh, well, what's the time now? Okay, cool. Okay, Lua Resty Core. That's another Lua library I created at Cloudflare. So, what does this library do? NGX Lua provides a lot of Lua APIs, but these Lua APIs are based on Lua C function. Let's see from this graph. Oops. So NX is a plate, boilerplate. And NX Lua is built up on top of it. And 
NGX Lua tries to expose many NGX goodies via Lua API so that Lua programmers can script them on the fly. And to expose this C API, NGX Lua uses the standard Lua C function mechanism from the standard Lua interpreter, and which also works in Lua JIT, but it prevents just in time compilation. So how Lua JIT works? We load Lua JIT bytecode into an interpreter, and the interpreter runs it over and over again. At some, at, upon some threshold, it finds that a particular loop or a particular Lua function is hot, then it invokes the compiler to actually compile the hot bytecode sequences into native machine code, which is the real speed, sp speed thing. And, uh, but in case that it finds something that it, the compiler finds, finds something it cannot understand, it will fall back, force back to the interpreter, which, mean, which also called trace aborts. Then code is still keep uh, still keeping running the interpreter, and we don't want that to happen. And for the Lua C function mechanism, because it, it is the Lua VM C API, it is a traditional way to extend a, v, a dynamic language VM, and which means it, it has side effects, unavoidable side effects in the VM, like Python's Py, Python standard binding API and Perl standard binding API, all change the state in the VM, right? And for such kind of things, the just-in-time compiler cannot do a great job because it has side effects in the VM. It has to synchronize the side effects, the, the effects of the generated machine code with the VM states, which is very expensive. So for the dynamic language to run really, really fast, we want to totally avoid side effects in the VM state so that when the machine code, the JIT code is running, we don't have to synchronize the state with the VM, right? That, that, is, that, that is the secret of Blue JIT, and that is the future of speed. So we need this thing. My core created FFI just for this purpose, and also it makes calling external C code incredibly easy. And you, you have the, the capability to just de declare the C function prototypes directly in Lua and then just call it right away. And this way, the C functions are not using any Lua VM's C API, which means they are side effects free. And the just-in-time compiler can generate very compact machine code for the hot loops, the hot Lua functions, et cetera. So it's, so it's double wings. And then it like this. Lua REST core is a cap on the existing API. It, it overrides the APIs that it can do much better. So Lua REST core uses FFI to override part of the standard NGX Lua's Lua API functions. From our production profiling results, much more CPU time is now spent on JIT compiled Lua code, which means a good thing, because in the past, more CPU time spent on interpret code. And we do have a lot of funny tools like this. And with this simple command line utility, you can trace any NGX worker processes in production on the fly, real time, um, with minimal overhead on the client traffic, thanks to the dynamic tracing technologies developed in the 21st century. <laughs> and uh, now we can specify the PID 6817 layer dash x option. And then we specify how long we want to sample, like 60 seconds. So when this tool is not sampling, there's literally zero overhead there. And only when this tool is running for 60 seconds, there's a very minimal, like below 5% according to our profiling, our benchmark. And so we can see that we, we get a report for all the events happened in the last 60 seconds at real time. Like the compiled, 27% of the compiled time is spent on compiled Lua code and interpreted Lua code. And the C code called by interpreted Lua via the traditional Lua, standard Lua C API spinning and garbage collector and maybe other things. So such tools are very cool and I'll talk about them in more detail later. 
So in the, this is the old result before the Lua RSD core integration. And this is the new result. We can see that the compiled code's CPU time is now 64%, which means more CPU time is spent on actually compiled code. And we can, because we have more GTD code, we can see other items show, showing up, like trace access, because, because entering and exiting compiled code is, is expensive because it requires synchronizing the VM state, remember? Synchronizing is expensive, but it is inevitable while exiting the compiled code execution. So we can see the item here, but just four samples, almost zero. And also other things like the garbage collector things. And according to our benchmark, for a simple get request, oops. For a simple get request, it is 100% faster. Okay, back to our tools. Continue our journey with tools. I created this open source project on GitHub. It's named NGX SystemTab Toolkit. And I also used to work closely with the SystemTab developers. They are very friendly and helpful. And they are great guys mostly from Red Hat. And I created a lot of tools in this project. The sizes of the font are calculated according to Google result count. So it's an indication for their popularity. And sample BT is the most popular tool because it can generate C level or assembly level flame graphs. It's on CPU flame graphs. And uh, it's not specific to NGX. It can work on any C and C++ and other language, static languages com um, programs, as long as system tab can understand their backtraces. So even you can run it over JVM, for example, as long as you can get backtraces. And we also use the sample BT tool to profile our Kyoto Tycoon and Tokyo cabinet key value store services and, all, and uh, many other things. But, but sadly, Go programs are very strange. <laughs> that, that traditional tool chains do, are still having problems understanding the Go backtraces. So volunteers welcome. And uh, later I created a step XX, i.e. step plus plus project. It's, uh, Syntax, it adds a syntactic sugar, it's a wrapper uh, uh, for the system tab scripting language. Yes, system tab is, has a scripting language, but it's not flexible enough for creating everyday tools. So I create a macro based high level language atop system tab's own language. It's named step, step plus plus, in the same spirit of C plus plus. And newer tools are written in step plus plus instead of in the native system tab scripting language. And uh, we have a lot of tools for analyzing the Lua JVM, the NGX core, and many other things like TCP and UDP receive time, real time tracing. So that we don't have to generate a lot of log data. I hate logs, to be honest, though it's, a spirit, though it's in the spirit of the big data. Because logging is expensive, no matter what. So you have to accumulate a huge amount of data, e either pipe, pipe, pipe into a, to a socket or just write into the disk, which is expensive, no matter what. And also file, file I/O is always almost always blocking unless you use, you are using the broken asynchronous I/O thing from the Linux kernel, and the, the spirit of dynamic tracing, in, on the other hand, is aggregating data as the data source without moving the data around is huge and you have no idea what data you might need someday, right? So most of the tools are created after the servers are running. So I don't want to change it, I don't want to reload it, I don't want to restart it. So I, I need a green, clean, safe way to cheaply get exactly what I want to answer my questions immediately. So dynamic tracing is, is, is really the dawn of the future. <laughs> and the system tab, D-Trace, and many goodies are dynamic tracing representatives. So here's a case study. 
when Nops guy from our Nops team calls me that some Nginx worker or some Nginx server CPU is too high, they are CPU hogs, and what, what should I do? So the little nasty boy is the program, the Nginx worker. So sometimes this may be in the off CPU state. The reasons may vary, like it is switched off from the CPU by the kernel scheduler, or it is blocking on a system level mutex, the lock. And sometimes it may be blocking on file I.O. as I mentioned before, file I.O. is almost always blocking. And when it climbs up, it has a chance to make use of the CPU, we call it on CPU state. So it's busy executing machine code, right? Or other things, a top machine code. We have another simple tool. I will run this tool first to ensure that is, ha that is having problems or is just uh, serving too much traffic without looking at logs, because logs always have delay and other things. It's complicated and it's a mess. So with this tool, it's very cheap. You can just uh, nail down a single worker very quickly at real time. So the output is one second a line. You can see how many requests it has completed within that very second. And we can see that 300 requests per second is not very good, right? So we, we keep digging. If we know that it's like thousands of requests per second or even more, it may be just a busy, too busy with too, many, too much traffic. And we may, in that, in that direction, we may check if it's a L7 attack instead. And the second step is to take a deeper look at what is busy inside NGX worker process. So the sample BT tool mentioned earlier shows up again. With this tool, we specify the PID, the same worker PID, and the time we want to sample. The 20 seconds may be good, but it's up to the actual application, right? And we redirect the output to a local file named a.bt. The output is aggregated, so the file is usually small, within one megabyte or something. And uh, the overhead is very small with regard to the application itself. Why? Because it uses a sampling method. It's not traces everything. It just uh, traces a state every like one minute second or, or so. And then after this total sampling window is over, it, it exits and generates a very small file for analyze. And uh, here, we use Brandon Gregg's tools. Actually, we automate these two steps in production. And Brandon Gregg is, I think, is the creator of the idea of flame grass. And I really love his ideas, especially this one. It's just uh, uniquely useful and general. You can, you can analyze everything. And uh, you, you first collapse the, the backtraces and then generate an SVG animation file, which can be shown up very nicely in a web browser. Here we go. It's a flame graph. So most of my pr optimization work is based on flame graphs. It's by looking at individual flame graphs every day. And uh, this graph is on CPU flame graph. We will, we will see more types of flame graphs later. And it's also C-level flame graphs because it samples on the C-level or equivalent assembly level as long as the tool chain can find the debug information, right? And in this graph, we have something to say. It's a real flame graph from production. And this, this Backtraces are incomplete. It's a backtraces, right? It's aggregated backtrace. So look at the width. The wider the tower, the more CPU time it takes. So the very thin towers, very slim towers are actually minor things. And ignore the colors. The colors are picked up randomly, just for fanciness. And uh, this is the NX frame graph. We can see that some of these are incomplete, right? because most of the complete backtraces should start from the main function, the C function's entry point, right? And this is a libc entry point. We can see the libc details below. And uh, for incomplete backtraces, which means several possibilities. One possibility is that it is just-in-time compiler-generated machine code, 
like from JVM, from Lua JIT, from PCRE JIT, they don't carry any debug information. Or maybe, but, but not at startup time, because system tab is static tool. Uh, another possibility is that your C programs or particular C libraries lack debug information because you may strip it or may just maybe compile uh, without a dash, dash G option. So most of the time we want to fix this. And this tower you, you may not see very clearly because of the long NGX C function S, but I can tell you that this is the Lua VM execution. And this is the GZIP. Look at the tip, it's a GZIP deflate. And this is the Lua, Lua and other things. And this is a GZIP again, so it's something like that. So when you see that something is hot, you want to take a deeper look. Look, for example, we want to look look at those Lua specific things. But but from this C level, since we can see the Lua JIT VM bottlenecks, actually I I have found a lot of funny things in the Lua JIT VM, and I reported reported these issues back to Mike Poe, and, and he, he, he was very happy to fix them. Because, because it, it's the clues from the real production sense, right? Um, so it gives a very low level view and general view. Further, we want to know the clues on the Lua code level, not on the VM level. On the VM level, you only see the VM primitives, like Stringland, like GC, like other things. And we have a higher level flame graph for the Lua language level, the LJ Lua stacks tool. We also sample for 20 seconds. This tool samples Lua backtraces instead of C backtraces. And the following two steps are exactly the same. And we get a flame graph for Lua functions. These backtraces are Lua backtraces, also a real one from production. And you can see the relationship the bottom is uh, rewrite by Lua, for example, locked by Lua. This is the entry point, and the backtrace grows that way. So you can see how CPU time is distributed across all the Lua code paths. That is incredibly useful, and we can just uh, focus on those code paths and make them disappear from the flame graphs. There's another case study, when a NGX worker CPU is low, but it's also slow, then something else is happening. So in this case, what tools should we use? This is the off CPU case as mentioned earlier. So the process is sleeping for some reasons that we don't know, and we need to figure it out very quickly without wasting our time, without errors and trials. And uh, off CPU flame graphs come into play with another tool, the sample BT off CPU tool. Here we go. This is a real production flame graph, which shows a, a very old problem we used to have in a particular production machine. And uh, what's the problem? We can see that the big towers on the left side and the right side, the tip, the tip sometimes gives the clue. The open sys core, you can see that. And the, the P read system core on the, this tip. And the uh, same await, it's a semaphore, it's a lock. And the P read and open. So, and this is open too. This, this is also a tower. So we get a lot of information from a single graph. To summarize, we're having blocking file I.O. problems here. And to eliminate this problem, we can use NGX's open file cache to save the open system cores because it cached the file handles. But sadly, we didn't do it right. And it's still slow. This graph shows why. Most of the time is spent now spent on mutex, the, the lock thing, right? So what did, we, did, what did we do wrong? The mistake we made is to make the open file cache size too large, which leads to a huge RB tree for the cache. So every cache holder spends 
much more CPU time to traverse through this RB tree, which blocks other workers, make, make them waiting on the lock for much longer. So, so we can see that the tools can immediately tell us what is going wrong, and, e and, and sometimes they tell us how to fix things, but if we fix them wrong, they can also quickly tell us why. So this capability is, is amazing, and it's, it can ensure that we are always on the right path. Without looking at the graph, we may consider, oh, open file cache didn't do what we want, doesn't fulfill our needs, but which is wrong, because we, we didn't configure the parameter right, right? So we can now be, have much more good sleep. This is how SiddenTap works. It's a very mature dynamic tracing tool for the Linux world. And uh, basically, we, we write tools in the scripting language named STP, the blue box, and then feed it to the SiddenTap front end, the command line ut utility named STEP, and it compiles the script down to a kernel module, and then insert it into a kernel on the fly. And when the tool exits, it removes the module without polluting the kernel. And because this tool runs in the kernel, it knows everything. Because this creator is in the god, right? It can inspect the user space. It can inspect the kernel space. You, the, it can combine, combine the information from both worlds in a single state machine. And then we take a look at the GDB utilities. Oh, sorry for the time. <laughs> well, I'll be quick. The NGX GDB utilities is, has the advantage that they can run anywhere. GDB can run. And uh, these tools are very powerful and sometimes equally powerful certain type tools, but they are slow. So they are good for offline analysis like code up analysis or development analysis. And they are written in Python because I have no choice. GDB only provides Python as uh, extension language. And I w I'm going to embed LuaJIT into it and maybe better performance. So we have various different GDB commands that you can run directly in the GDB prompt. I have LBT for getting the Lua backtrace in the current breakpoint, whatever breakpoint. You can get a Lua backtrace. And you can get a BT4, just like BT4, but it's for, it's for Lua, Lua land. And you can get the garbage collector memory size. You can get the memory statistics, like uh, across all the different types of Lua values, Lua GC objects. So this, these tools are invaluable for analyze how particular things, how a particular Lua program is using memory, like troubleshooting memory leaks or something. We are hiring. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, we, we, we do have a OpenResty English mailing list, and people also love to ask NX questions there, because we are a superset of NX, and you are welcome to subscribe to that list. It's on Google Groups. And uh, other, other, any other questions can send emails. Any questions right now? Okay. To-do list, you mean? Sorry? You mean to-do list? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I do have a to-do list in the <laughs> NX Lures modules wiki page, in the documentation. And if you have strong opinions about OpenRST or NX Lures future, you can join the list and speak out. Okay, thank you so much.